any literal way the Son of God. And they had a conflict with another version of Christianity. Another version of Christianity that is being developed by a man called Paul. Who teaches his own gospel. A man who, strangely enough, never met the, never met the apostles, never studied with them, never saw Jesus, except as he claimed in a vision... But he never saw the living Jesus. He never spoke to the Jesus that was alive on earth. After seeing this vision of Jesus, he disappears and goes to Arabia, of all places, for three years. And then re-emerges, preaching a gospel to the Gentiles. That means the non-Jews. But what is this gospel? What is the nature of this gospel? What is this gospel saying? This gospel is teaching a different message. This gospel is teaching that the law is cursed. That you don't need to follow the law. That salvation does not come by obeying God and following His commandments and observing the law, but salvation comes by believing in a crucified Christ. A type of saviour figure whose blood has been shed as a sacrifice for the sins of humanity. And that by accepting this sacrifice, believing in this almost divine being, because actually Paul does not go as far, by the way, as modern Trinitarian Christians. Paul never actually clearly makes Jesus the same as God. He, he makes a distinction between Jesus and God. He clearly shows that Jesus and God are different. But from this Pauline theology which is very, very close to paganism, emerges this new gospel, this new idea, this mystery cult, as they call it, where now we have not Jesus the figure rooted in history, but we have Jesus the mythology. We have this mythology emerging about Jesus. So what we find here is that historically, historically, when we examine the history the truth about Jesus is without doubt not clear. What we call Christianity today is actually one version. One version of what some people came to believe about Jesus. A version that happened to dominate. The reasons how it came to dominate is something that hopefully we will talk about in the next lecture which I'll give in Melbourne you'll be able to get the tape soon, how it came to dominate, how it came to succeed. Partly because it was so familiar to pagans, what it was teaching was so close to what they already believed, and partly through pure aggression and bloodshed. It was imposed, literally imposed, by the Roman Empire to be the universal religion of the Roman Empire, by the force of sword. And it's ironic that they say Islam was spread by the sword. But what you call modern Christianity, Trinitarian Christianity, was pretty much itself. It was spread by the sword. So this is the historical truth. What you make of it, of course, is up to you. There is another way, of course, that we could try and determine the truth of things. And that is not necessarily connected with history but it is really just using a process of reasoning. So in the last few minutes, I would like to use the process of reasoning in examining the truth about Jesus. Now there are some claims that are made by Christians about Jesus. And amongst those claims are that Jesus is God incarnate, that Jesus is actually God, and that Jesus is the Son of God. And these are the two claims that I want to spend the last few minutes examining. Just through, through, from the point of view of reason. And how it cannot possibly be truth. It cannot possibly be truth. Because if we mean by truth something that we can reason and establish to be a fact, then by definition, it can't be something that contradicts itself. 
And this is very interesting because if you get a Jew, a Christian and a Muslim and probably if you got a Hindu and a Sikh sitting round the table together and we agreed to make a definition of God that we all agreed about nearly everybody would agree that there is one God that God is infinite God is self-sufficient and God is immortal that God is all-knowing. So we'd probably all of us agree that there is a living, existing, self-sufficient, eternal, immortal, all-omniscient God. And every Jew and Christian would definitely agree about that and probably most Hindus and Sikhs would agree about it as well. That's how we define God. We define God as being all-knowing, all-seeing, all-hearing. We define God as being eternal. We define God as not needing anything, being free from all wants and free from all needs, self-sufficient and immortal. In other words, God never dies. He's ever living. He is the first before whom there is none and he is the last after whom there is none. Then let us define man. Man, by definition, does not fit those characteristics. Man, by definition, is born and dies. That makes us mortal. Man, or to use the politically correct term, you know, humans, men and women, right? Okay, humans, human beings, they're born and they die, so they are mortal by definition. They are needy, meaning we need to breathe, we need to eat, we need to drink. We have many other needs, but we have needs, so we are not, therefore, self-sufficient. We are limited in our knowledge. We are limited in our knowledge. We are not all-knowing and all-seeing and all-hearing. So therefore, what defines a human being is very different from what defines a God. Or what defines the God, the Creator. Now, how can something be two opposites at the same time? How can God be eternal and immortal, and be temporary, and mortal, at the same time? How can God be self-sufficient, and needy, at the same time? How can something be all-knowing, and ignorant of things, at the same time? It doesn't mean anything. By definition, to say God became a man, actually has no meaning. It's not something